things that, that's a typical response to Atlas Shrugged is for people to focus purely on the economic and on the political aspects. And they miss the things like the, this, this, this view of romantic love, or they miss things about the morality of money even. So they, they, they focus purely on the, the conflict between the looters and the producers and the, the economic burdens and how that's inefficient and so on. And, and what, I'm gonna, what I want to do, what I want to sort of argue for, with you guys a little bit, or argue to you guys a little bit, is to say, look, there's so much more to this novel. And so if you focus, if you, if you think about the novel and, and remember the big political conflict, the big economic conflict, the big social conflict, you are missing a whole lot of really, really interesting, detailed stuff, stuff that's in the novel. And so what I'm going to do is talk about just one just, uh, uh, well, likely I'll just have time for one, one example. And this is not, it's not even a political example at all. It's scientific. It's the example of Dr. Robert Stadler. Because there's a kind of easy story to tell about Stadler, and then there's the fuller, deeper psychological story that, that Rand wants to tell about Stadler. And one of the reasons, this is not the most important story in the book, but one of the reasons I, I picked this one is because it's, it doesn't really have any spoilers, so I'm not going to tell you, for those of you who haven't read the book, I'm not going to be spoiling the, the basic plot here. So who was Robert Sadler? Somebody, somebody remind us who, who this character of Robert Sadler is. He's a government scientist. Yeah, so he's this physicist, and he's, he studies cosmic rays, so his sort of brain is out there in the farthest stretches of the universe. And he's, he's a guy who has this deep passion for his work. He loves his work. He worships intelligence. Um, worships genius, but he has this kind of common flaw of the genius. He's somebody who, who is disdainful of ordinary people and their ordinary practical petty concerns. He has this particular dislike of businessmen, these money-grubbing businessmen who don't care for his work, for truth, for science, and so on. And so he sees this as a problem, it's an obstacle, because god damn it, it's these money-grubbing businesses that would be giving him research grants and they don't care about his work, they don't care about truth. And so, like, no, I don't want to have to deal with this. I just want to be able to do my work. And so what he does is he decides to make a um, science-government partnership. Right? This is going to work out well. And um, <laughs> so, so recall that he founds the State Science Institute. And this is something that sort of couldn't have been done without his name behind it. And what he figures is, look, I can't, I can't make these people value my work in the way that it should be valued, so I'm going to use the government as my funding source. Won't this be great, right? Won't this be fabulous? Because then I don't have to worry about funds. I, I'm just going to have these tax dollars rolling in, rolling in. I don't have to convince anybody of anything. The government's just going to give me more money. And I'm never going to have to worry about my funding ever again. Um, so does this work? <laughs> Oh, thank you, Hannah. Um, <laughs> uh, does is this is this effective? Is this a uh, those of you who've read the book? So what what actually happens to him? Is this all hunky dory? He gets whatever funding he wants for the rest of his life, and he's perfectly set up, or does this go awry a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> goes a little bit awry, right? <laughs> and there's a kind of um, there's a kind of obvious way in which it goes in which it goes awry. There's this problem that. His government masters, I mean, he used, to, he used to think that he was, he would be free of the interference of other people if he would have these tax dollars. But he finds, in fact, that what he has is a new master. So who are, who are the people who are now in charge of his work? Bureaucrats. The bureaucrats, the politicians, right? And so all of a sudden, he is starting to, and, and instead of having multiple funding sources where, you know, if he pisses off this one businessman, he can go to the other ones, He's got the same, the, there's one person paying the bill and it's the government, all the looters, and he's got to kowtow to them, and if he displeases them, he's in trouble. And so we see this, this time and time again that he is faced with a choice between the truth, between doing what's right, the truth, versus on the other hand, doing what his government masters want, and gee, which way does he choose? He does what his government masters want, and each time they're asking more of him, they're asking him to sacrifice more of, more of his integrity. Now, this is not a story that's uncommon today. I mean, I think we see this kind of, govern this kind of government corruption of science with, what was, what was that? Global warming. Global warming, with climate change. We see it in, the, in, in something that I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not up on the climate change uh, literature, but 
but in, in research about nutrition and health, where the government has its certain set of nutritional standards, and, you know, look, if you're a researcher and you're not going to count out of that, too bad, right? You're not going to get funded, you're going to be, and so all these researchers are like, ah, I'm not really interested in looking at those fundamental issues, I just want to do my little research over here. And, and so, so we see that kind of government corruption of, of science wherever the government has its, has its hands. But here's, the, here's the, the, the critical point is that Rand is making a deeper point because Stadler is not just a guy who maintains his integrity in his own head but is kowtowing to the government in his actions. He is somebody, he is corrupting his own soul by making this deal with his government masters. And he's corrupted his own soul because in founding the State Science Institute, he has endorsed the principle that government force is a practical means of getting what he wants. He can't persuade people. He's giving up persuasion as a model of dealing with other people. And he's saying force is okay. And that has implications for him and how he acts on a day-to-day -day basis well beyond just is he going to trash rear metal or not? Is he going to stand up to this book, this awful book that Floyd Ferris wrote or not? He is going to be endorsing force as a means of dealing with people and, and endorsing force because he wants something. I want this and people don't want to give it to me, so I'm going to force them and that's okay. That's the principle that he's, he's endorsed in, in founding the State Science Institute. And what we see over time is this absolute corrosion of his soul so that this man of science, this man who cared about reason and truth and, and the, the, um, the, the facts of reality above all else, becomes somebody who doesn't give a damn about the facts, doesn't give a damn about truth, doesn't give a damn about science, and in fact, once, you know, he, I mentioned at the beginning he's the man who, who worships intelligence, well, he now hates intelligence and he ends up wanting to kill his best student. So this is the kind of psychological switch, this kind of psychological degradation that we see um, in, this, in this case of, of Stadler, and this is because he's accepted a certain kind of principle. So Rand here, the, the point that I want to make here is, look, there's this sort of more ordinary story about the corruption of science that Rand is telling us. But there's also this deeper story, the psychological story about the corruption of a man's soul. And this happens by his endorsing a certain kind of political principle that most people would think, well, that's not going to have an impact in the rest of your life. No, it does, and it has a, it has a big impact. Um, it has the impact of, of truly, truly destroying destroying this Dr. Robert Stadler. So, I hope this is a little bit intriguing to you. Maybe you didn't notice that. Maybe you didn't notice the corruption of, of Stadler's character in this deep way and, and connect that to his political views. And so what, I'm, what I want to what advocate, what I want to pitch to you, is go and reread Atlas Shrugged again if you haven't in a while. Go and notice all of this psychology, the ethics, the fundamental philosophy that's in that book. It's very, very different. It's, it's going to rock your world. It's going to be different than anything else. There's a lot of people, let's say a lot of Christians, who read it and they just they want to attach some capitalist politics onto this, onto this novel. And I'm here to tell you, you cannot do that. It is too fundamentally challenging. to It's, it's questioning all of that at too fun, fundamental of a level for that. So if you haven't read the book in a while or if you, you think you might have missed some of these things, reread the book listen to my podcast, perhaps join an Atlas Shred reading group, and see what else there is to this novel.